15 copies, so I hope there's enough to go around. And, and everything that is passed out tonight, we will put up on the web so that you'll have access to them too. That way, if uh, we don't have enough color copies, you'll be able to pull a color copy. Yep. Jeff, what I'm passing around right now um, is basically an overview of the downtown National Register of Historic Districts. Okay. And um, my scribble notes all over it. Um, if you can read those, you're really amazing uh, because they're all in different directions and everything. But it's what, as those go around, you can still see those with enough light. The, uh, the downtown, you guys probably know more, I'm sure you know more about this than I do. The downtown historic district uh, basically is about 40 buildings of which um, there's the National Register District is this orange boundary that runs around the outside, runs from the, down to the river and back up along uh, the back of Russell Street, and back down Madison Avenue and, and closes in this shape. But it, it encompasses roughly 40, uh, 42 buildings. Some are not contributing within that district, but they're really, uh, I think both Ellen and I as architects, when we, when we come to Skowhegan um, and look at it with, with, with our eyes, it's, it's a fantastic collection of very, very high quality architectural buildings. Yeah, you really don't want to drive behind us when we're driving. <laughs> don't, right. Don't get too close. Um, because oh, we're stopping all the time and looking at the details, but there's some fabulous, fabulous details in this community. Um, we're going to see some of them. So we should probably introduce ourselves. Yes, I'm Ellen Angel, and yeah. I'm the principal of Ames Associates, and Mike is uh, our senior architect. And Ames Associates is a firm in, in Bangor. We specialize in historic preservation, but we also do all kinds of architectural work, um, everything from, gosh, I don't know, college uh, uh, lecture halls to, uh, I don't know, convenience stores. I mean, we do a lot of different kinds of things. So um, uh, we're very excited to be working on this project, and, and again, because we specialize in historic preservation, we've done, we've done downtown work like this, Main Street work. We've also done work with private property owners. I'm a, was a long-term downtown uh, building, business building owner in Eastport. And so I have a, a great deal of empathy, <laughs> great deal of empathy for owners of historic buildings because I know how expensive it is to maintain them, how hard it is to actually try and do the restoration work. Everything is more complicated and more expensive than you ever thought it could be. It's just how it is. And I mean, we owned our building for 15 years. In the first 10 years, we probably spent $40,000 and it didn't look a bit different than it did before we spent all that money. So, you know, it's, um, it's just one of those things where uh, it's really a treasure. It's a national treasure. I mean, downtown Skowhegan, this national, uh, Register, you know, historic district is really a, 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 a statement as to how valuable these buildings are nationally, right? It's, a, it's something that we don't, you don't find everywhere. We kind of take it for granted in Maine because there's so many towns that have been here since the 1800s, but it's not something you find that, uh, in that great in numbers throughout the rest of the United States. So in order for it to be to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places, it really has to be a historic place. So um, you've made a, a major achievement. Now, you know what we want to help you do is to do some things that bring the quality of, of your buildings up to what their potential is. So then, I, I think that tells you enough about, about probably Mike and I. Michael, <laughs> go ahead and tell you a little bit about what you actually have. Available, um, or just on here, but yes. could be available for the group to use hereafter. 
right? Um, so uh, we, we will be glad to, uh, to, to share that with everybody. The, the, before I get started, um, I did want to say that as anyone, and not just architects, but anyone that, that visits a community, the, the uh, quality of that community is perceived in the architecture of the place. It really is. Whatever community you're visiting, whether it's Stetson, Maine, or Corinna, or Skowhegan, or Augusta, when you ride into that town the first time or any time thereafter, it's the quality of that architecture that really defines your community. And that's why Skowhegan is such a very special place. And we're hopefully going to be able to help you to recognize, um, and I know I've, if you've lived in a place, like I grew up in Bangor, I lived in, in, in Maine all my life, uh, Ellen's lucky enough to be here from California, but loves Maine even more than many 25 people. 25 years in Maine. So. 25 years in Maine makes you almost like a native. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, um, I'm still from away. I'm sorry. I apologize. But, but the reality is, as she says, um, many of the western parts of the country don't have the depth of the, of the wonderful buildings that we do. So the opening slide that we have here um, is basically uh, a look down at the intersection, a building called the... Um, the Samson and Griffin. There must have been a lot of Griffins involved in the history of Skowhegan because there's several of the buildings and blocks that were named after Griffins. Um, Griffin and Wentworth for the um, Rusikoff jewelers. Um, this one was the Samson and Griffin building on the corner, which was, I think, originally a drugstore. But the, the topics that we're going to cover tonight, I kind of brought my handy dandy laser pointer. Jeff, is, it, is that visible for everybody? Yes. Do we need to cut the lights, or is that, yeah. is that OK? Can everybody see that OK? It's like the color seems a little washed out there. Oh, is that a little better? Yes. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, so we're going to take a look at Skowhegan. We're going to, uh, then and now, uh, we're going to, um, to take a minute to kind of understand, look in, and try to understand what commercial buildings are all about. And I understand that that within your facade, within this facade program, there are buildings that are outside of the downtown proper. And so, but many of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight apply to all buildings. Right, and, and whether they're yeah. historic or not. And yes. whether, thank you, whether they're historic or not. It's just best ways, best practices for keeping buildings up. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the current codes in Maine, and especially about this code that's just gone into effect in the last few years. It's called the International Existing Building Code. 2009. That's basically the code that applies to most existing buildings in the state. And there's a special section in there just for historic buildings, which these would all, in the National Register District, all of those buildings would qualify as historic, as certified historic buildings. We're going to talk a little bit about preservation. Um, we're going to talk about some standards and rehabilitation, uh, for rehabilitation, and, and close with some resources uh, and, and funding options. So, Let's see if I can move that, that away, or move that, that away. Whoops, that's the wrong way. No, it's not right. Damn it. Sure. <laughs> it's up or down here. Sorry. I'm not sure where. I wish this was the purpose. Yeah, you're going, actually going backwards now. Oh, yeah, I'm going backwards now. So just, get, just go this. back to the beginning. Thank you. Okay. So how do I advance it again? Yeah. I don't click. Down. Oh, right. Okay. And there's left. Okay. Good. Very good. Those ones. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So as we look, as we look at these wonderful images of of, of Skowhegan then, of years gone by, a lot of these buildings are still present. Here we are in 1918, Armistice Day, on May on Water Street in downtown Skowhegan. Uh, you see these same buildings, the gray building, the gray block, the Merrill block are still there. The essence of the downtown is still intact it's in this beautiful street called Water Street. You have one of the most beautiful and significant power stations designed by John Calvin Stevens, the architect for this beautiful building that we're in, very important main architect, designed this beautiful uh, Beaux-Arts neoclassical uh, power station. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, your location on, on the water is significant. Uh, the island, you know, how many communities can, can brag that they've got an island as a part of their downtown extension? Not too many. Um, 
And as we look back at some of the buildings and, and what is worth preserving in downtown uh, Skowhegan, um, we see really great evidence here of what facades were like and what they've, how they've uh, been changed or modified over time from early storefronts like this to some of the later period buildings and uh, what's important, we're going to talk about what's important in that architecture to preserve. Um, but looking before I go too much further, I will point out that um, most of these buildings that in the downtown date from about 1870, 1880 to 1910 or 1920. So it was a block of about 30, uh, 40 years where a significant amount of buildings were put in place. There was a prosperity that was going on at that time and the need to build your downtown and to build this wonderful uh, uh, group of buildings that we see today. Um, when we talk about facades and downtown storefronts, we're going to be talking about, the, uh, and I'm going to get into it in greater detail in a moment, but here's a really good example of an early storefront. This was probably before 1910, uh, because around that period they were building them out of modular systems. Um, Conier, the great uh, manufacturer of, of window systems that's still around today, uh, and Mesker were some of the early storefront manufacturers. Prior to that, they were actually rather like this. If you can see closely here, they were almost like uh, uh, wood sash windows. They were actually very early ones were in a model that looked more like that, blocked out as large windows for the purpose of displaying merchandise. The purpose has not changed. It's still for displaying merchandise. But as we see this transition from the early commercial buildings becoming coming from residential buildings, as you see here, a lot of your early residential buildings were converted ultimately to commercial use. So what we see further on, uh, down here in this lower right photograph, um, a portion of this block still is, is retained 18, from 1850. These other buildings were replaced with the First National and the, and the Depositors Trust buildings that are down on Lower Water Street, but if you look closely, you can see where these original residential buildings were ultimately modified, and the storefronts were beginning to come into place here as the first evidence of commercial activity. So oftentimes the families, or there was residential uh, uses upstairs, and uh, commercial activities were beginning on the, on the downtown storefronts. This was early. Um, we looked at, uh, Jeff was nice enough to drive us around with some of the, all, all of the uh, listings of the buildings that are intended for facade improvements, and the, the Baptist Church, the beautiful Baptist Church adjacent to Bloomfield Academy, which you can see kind of peeking through the trees here. That is a really beautiful pair of buildings side by side. And I gotta say, uh, the closer that I look at this Bloomfield Academy, if you've ever seen Hamden's Academy, because I'm from Hamden, Hamden's Academy in 1843 is almost identical, almost verbatim, right there, for you, um, to this building right here. So it's, it was a Greek Revival style that either was probably built here first, before Hamden took their cue from Bloomfield Academy and built theirs, almost identical, almost identical, um, with the exception of the metal roofs. And there's something going on with the metal roofs down this way. Um, you all know in your history about Margaret Chase Smith, and in Margaret Chase Smith appears uh, here in this wonderful photograph in front of what is today the Smith Whittier block. A uh, young uh, Margaret Chase Smith, I believe that's her. That's the chin in the photograph. Like her chin, sir. Right there. Um, and coming into Skowhegan from the um, from the island, and looking straight into that that Samson Griffin block and how the city is, uh, how the downtown is rather split at, at that point. Um, it's probably like Bangor. Bangor was not always a rotary, but I suspect that here's at some time in history did they decide to put a rotary in downtown. Yeah. See, that was a kind of a movement probably. I can't tell if this was rotary at that time or not, but this might have been two-way traffic and that would be too conflicting at each end. But it's interesting how that block with Russell, is it Russell Street or Russell Avenue in the back, splits away and develops this triangular block that we have left here. And um, finally, before we leave the downtown on Water Street and go across the bridge, you have this, the, the remnants of this building still left. And again, you can see early storefront systems in here 
This is a fairly early photograph. A lot of these photographs are written from your uh, Skowhegan uh, Historical Society. Very generous with your photography. I would say anybody interested in preserving buildings should do research, uh, and they can do a lot more research than what we've gathered here tonight for you. A lot more research into what the history and the development of the downtown and your building in particular or buildings uh, uh, are. I thought this was great, though, to see kind of like a sampling of, um, of postcards over a period from 1888 to 95 to 1923 and 1924. They're not all necessarily taken from the same vantage point on Water Street, but what you can see, I think this might have been a hotel. Was there a Coburn Hotel? Yeah. Well, it, well the, the building you're looking at there was actually the Coburn House, Coburn which House. was the municipal building before this one was. Oh, okay. There was a large opera house in that and everything else before yeah. that one burnt. Oh, very good. I mean, not good that it burnt, but good, good information. <laughs> so, this one, these two might be taken from about the same vantage point. You can see there's been quite a bit of change that occurs in the downtown, in the fabric of the downtown. Uh, and these two were taken further up the street. A lot of these buildings uh, are still in place. This is the gray block, so-called, um, with its arches. Um, as I ride up and down, or we look at the, the architecture up and down the street, there's an awful lot of wonderful uh, arch top windows that occur at the upper floors here. That was something that's prevalent. Um, it's a Roman, um, kind of a Romanesque revival period um, when those buildings were put in. There's a lot of revivals that we're going to talk about, periods in the, in the late 1800s that, that, um, that the architecture was borrowed from. Uh, and you have examples, several examples of really, really good examples of, of many of those. Um, one of the things you might research um, is that, and I think you can get these right from your um, history house, here in, in Skowhegan are what are called Sanborn maps. Sanborn maps were a, um, uh, they were done periodically, was, they were actually fire insurance maps. They're full of fantastic information uh, if you learn how to read them. Um, and this is just a sampling of a piece of your downtown. I think they have them in digital form. You can buy them for various years, starting probably around 1888 or so, 1880, and running up to like 1930 or so. So if you really wanted to begin to do some research on the block of buildings and what, what has transpired and what has changed, uh, if I remember these red ones, Ellen, I think those are brick buildings. Brick. Yeah, yeah, uh, so good. they're identifying brick. They're telling you what maybe some of the uses were, in this case a drugstore. They might tell you something about, here's like an auto sales right here. So it's a snapshot in time. We found them to be very accurate. They, they were, Sandbar was actually an insurance company that insured commercial um, businesses and commercial buildings and so they would go in and map an area and you know obviously if you have one of those wood buildings you pay higher um, you pay a higher rate because they're more afraid that they would burn than the, than the, than the masonry buildings but they, they would rate the individual buildings in terms of um, you know the, their Fire ability resistance. to insure yeah. Yeah, yeah if they had some kind of a sprinkler system or whatever um, and then set the insurance rates by that. So so that's why they're so full of really good information. You can find out the base information of um, a lot of older buildings. So it might, if they're locally available and you can get them, it might be interesting to know, especially your, your uh, Main Street Skowhegan group, to kind of see these the pattern of change that's occurred in just this portion of this part of the community. And they'll cover the whole commercial area, so anything that was commercial in the year that they did the maps will be on the map. Yep. So looking um, at Skowhegan downtown now, um, we still see some very some fascinating, very, very powerful uh, and robust buildings that are in the downtown. The, um, I'm just going to point out a couple. The uh, Internet, the Oddfellows, International Order of Oddfellows building, really fine example. Again, arched windows at the top. You can see uh, coins done in brickwork. There's a lot of really fine detail that goes into these buildings. And what, what it has been preserved here, the columns and this sign band and all of the articulation in the masonry, it's really important vocabulary for everybody to really see the, the importance uh, and, the, and the presence that these buildings have. When you see it done right uh, or preserved from, the, from history, there's a real reason why the storefronts were, were retained and, and why they're so important to merchandising. Um, Skowhegan uh, has this wonderful 
uh, main grains, um, and it's becoming a real uh, uh, destination for people. We were talking about on the way down, we have friends that come here for just that purpose. And the more of that sort of thing that happens economically, uh, obviously the, the, the you know restaurants open up that serve that great product, um, it's, it's just, it's gonna build on itself. It's a wonderful idea and, it, and it's something that's really, really powerful. And it's an actually an interesting piece of architecture as you ride in that Court Street area, you see this, this the strength of this, um, you know, this powerful statement and, and reuse for what was, I think, the geo building, right? Yeah, really, really good stuff. This building, unfortunately, this storefront, has, uh, this building, I guess Jeff said, had not been reused lately, but it's still a fairly good example of um, uh, of, of storefront restoration. And I can point out some, and we're going to talk about this more in historic uh, uh, um, images coming up, but we have right here preserved that strong horizontal placement of what's called the sign band. This is one of the most important elements of your storefront right here. And you can see the sign band preserved here. Whenever that's lost, whenever that's covered up, we really diminish the ability to see that important distinction between what was commercial on the storefront and what was above it. So uh, we'll see some examples of that. But you see also here large merchandising windows. These are called the merchandising windows, transom lights above, recessed door panels, exposed columns uh, like this, these cast iron columns that you see here, all further evidence about the history and speaking about the language of that building. This is preserved, and here's what they've done for the John. This is a fascinating building right here. That's your Rusikov Jewelers. <coughs> um, that's the John Calvin Stevens design building, the same architect again that did this building right here, and the power station uh, for CMP. Um, their office was, was known for their um, revival styles. This is a bit in the Queen Anne style. Um, and you can see the bay windows here. The one thing I noticed, and it was striking to me when I rode up and down in Ellen 2, is the, the use of bay windows. All over this community, there's wonderful examples of bay windows that are used, especially in the downtown, and very creatively. Sometimes these bay windows are pushed back in, into, into masonry sockets. Sometimes they're pushed out. But we see bay windows, and that's a unique feature. It's also so, a sign of the wealth of the community. It and these little well, things yeah. were the ones that you know said, we're special. We can afford to do a little bit more. And exactly. Do it a little nicer. It is. It is. A, it is definitely a higher quality, a notch in, in quality. This building is a fascinating building. I think it's called the Gray Block. Um, you can see the series of arches up top, articulated in stone. You've got uh, the materials that are used here: copper, brick, and stone are lasting for hundreds of years. There's no reason to think that they're not going to last for hundreds of more years if these buildings are kept up. As architects, it's a bit sad for us to say that people brag today about building a 50-year building. That's called a really robust building by lead standards, by environmental standards. A 50-year building is shameful. These buildings are lasting hundreds of years. They've got pieces on them that require some attention, but if they're tended to, there's no reason to think that they won't last more than several hundred years more. The masonry walls on these buildings are substantial. They were not built just one brick width wide, which is what we do in brick buildings today. And that's why we can't get any play. So the sculptural play that you see all over these buildings, the ability to move bricks out and in and corbel them and do these wonderful details and develop panels, we can't do that with just one thickness of brick. So these buildings, are not only, they're precious because they can't build these again. These are extremely precious buildings. Mm -hmm. Um, this building I thought was a rather unique one. Oh, there's many, many unique buildings in the town, but this one is the Masonic Lodge, or the so-called. Um, and there's, there's the Eagles uh, Lodge, there's the National Order of Five Fellows. There's several of these fraternal organizations that uh, over time took over these buildings and have kept them up um, in, in, in very fine repair. Uh, again, really high quality products you can see in that building. Um, the um, the Dodge Block, so-called, down here at the end before we cross over on the bridge to the island. This Dodge building, I'm going to show you a, a photograph I've gone of that uh, in history. And the storefronts on that have has apparently been changed out a bit. But it still has a very interesting pattern of windows. The windows, you know, are five bays here and four bays there. Um, and there's, it, what it's saying is that there should be something in order 
that begins to line up above it. And I'll show you the historic photo of that. It's pretty amazing. Um, this group of buildings here seem to have been done about the same time. That's, again, another Griffin block building. The Griffins did several of the buildings in town, it appears. Um, I think it was these two were merged together right here. Yeah. Really substantial, if I remember. Is that right, Joe? Yes. Yeah. Um, and the, Str the uh, Strand Theater, your cinema, is, uh, has done a very good job. They did an expansion recently. I, we could barely see the scene between the, the two, the old and the new. It looked like they've done a wonderful job. That's a really fine little feature to have in the downtown, obviously. And this group of buildings down at the, low, at the lower end, or the end towards the island, um, would appear to have been two different banks at one time, maybe Depositors Trust and First National. Um, and they both carried similar details across them, which I think is really rather unique. Um, but really, really fine, high quality materials used here. Again, further up the street was the Augusta, was it Trust Bank that had the um, Art Deco. So you've got Art Deco style, you've got a lot of Romanesque Revival style buildings with the arches, which are really, really fantastic. Colonial Revival and some Gothic Revival. There's a lot of Revival styles in the downtown. Here's today. We have the Dodge Block. Um, you can see evidence of this was actually 1917, a couple of years, just a few years after the building was constructed. Um, and the storefronts were really a powerful part of the lower band of this building. Over time, things have gotten infilled, but there may still be the, this fabric to a large degree underneath those layers. Mike, you're saying that the picture on top is the building on the bottom? Yeah, it's taken on this side, Jeff, right here, the one, two, five window bays. Huh. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So it's the opposite side of what it's you It's not this have side, it's this, right, it's the five window side right here. And that, I think that building went online in 1914. Uh, said so there was a fire involved. So after the fire, there may have been some modifications done to this. That it actually looks like a structural, like what we call a glazed faced brick right. in the building now. So there might have been a fire in the building. I think we could probably do a little more research. But um, the point is, this could have, you can reinstall portions of, or at least give some direction to what that original storefront looked like which was transom lights up above, large transom lights to bring light deep into the shop, and then a band, and then the storefront glazing down below it. So it's quite a different feel for the building today. These are the parts that I, um, you're not gonna be tested on this, but uh, I will say that if you want to talk about historic buildings, especially downtown buildings, that this vocabulary is really important to know. And for several reasons. One of the reasons is when you're dealing with funding sources, and we're going to talk about that at the end, when you go after grants and you're putting together applications for, to try to seek money to help you to restore buildings, historic buildings, it's really important that, you, that they know that you understand the language. So for that reason, I'm going to give you just a quick overview of what's, what's important to notice in, in downtown buildings. This is a rather generic sort of a downtown building, a two-story building. Actually, it looks very similar to the 1880s buildings and turn of the century buildings that you've got here. And one of the buildings that you've got in town has a beautiful pediment on top done in copper. It says, um, I'm trying to remember the name, is it maybe the Martin Building? Um, Merrill. Um, what is it? I think it's the Merrill Building. Yes, it is. Thank you. The Merrill Building. And it's done in copper. And at the very top, it has a pediment that rides up above the cornice. The cornice band is this articulated band. It may have brackets, it may not. It may be simple, but it's oftentimes projected. And it really forms like a shadow front out to stop your eye when you're looking at a building like this. This building, by the way, is called a three-bay building because the pilasters here break it up into bays. So there's three important bays, the vertical bays of this building. You can look at many of your downtown buildings and they may have, you can see, easily described how the bays are arranged across the front. F in history, the, the storefront has been changed out to something that is contrary to the bays that were originally there, because they always tried to, or oftentimes, express what was above down below. If that gets changed, it feels confusing to people. When they look at that and lose this ability to translate from above to below, it feels a bit clumsy. And that's where we can lose things quickly. So 
Um, coming down from the top, window lintels can be bracketed. They can be just simple stone. You could just do a study in downtown and look at some of the beautiful brackets, uh, uh, lintels above your windows. Sometimes they're just done in brick, and the brick may be stood up on end, like soldier horses, uh, or it may be projected slightly. Oftentimes, again, with, the, with a thick brick wall, you can push and pull bricks in and out and develop a wonderful sculpture. And that's what you're seeing here expressed. Um, oftentimes, this framing inside the building would stop on these same lines. So to some degree, they're expressing what happens structurally inside the building. Sometimes beams will land on these pilasters or these columns, and it tells you a little bit about the framing uh, of the building. Um, the window sashes, we all know what sash panels are. This is uh, in a window sill. Sometimes the sills are in the same treatment as the head of the window or the lintel, but sometimes they're different. Um, this is a really critical part of your commercial storefront. Uh, or any, most any commercial buildings, is the sign, <coughs> sign board or fascia. Um, that's the place where they intentionally put a, a horizontal line of, to break up this, in, this modern storefront, so-called, from the components of the building above. That might have been office or residential or other uses. This was the commercial <coughs> storefront for sales. Bless you. Bless you. The sign band could be where the sign was applied, Sometimes in the early buildings, we're going to see where they actually hung signs here in Skowhegan just above this sign band or sign board uh, or fascia. And then sometimes in the very early years, they were just hung up above here. And they were tilted out oftentimes, just slightly. Immediately below that sign band or the horizontal band is the display, is the uh, transom lights. And those are these small windows that occur up above the, uh, what's called the display windows. Those might <coughs> have different types of glass in them. They oftentimes used what's called prismatic glass, which uh, in around 1900 to 1910 or 14, they would have been using a prismatic glass that actually was um, not translucent, but it was done to bounce light further into the deep, the depth of the shop. And that was, uh, the ceilings oftentimes stopped right at the same line right here. And uh, oftentimes they were painted out in light colors. So the light, this was a very sustainable today would be considered a very sustainable idea, to bring as much natural light into your shop as you can. And so they would be bouncing light off the ceiling from these high transom windows deep into the shop. And that was really good for merchandising. As well as using their display windows, oftentimes the original buildings were set up in such a way that you had what's called a lower bulkhead or window panel. This actually may have had a built-up portion so that there was a section here at, that was flush for the top of the bulkhead where mannequins or display elements could be set. And so those things were, and that began right around the turn of the century when they would begin to infill, to install these in such a way that also they could sometimes, by putting glass in here, drive light into the basement level of the building as well. So sometimes if you're lucky, you might look around town and see if any of these bulkheads in town had any evidence of prismatic glass or some kind of a, a light panel in the very bottom. Bangor only has a few left that I can find and I go looking for them. But they would also sometimes use them for loading. Sometimes those windows at the bulkhead would open up and things could be delivered down into the basement. So they had all kinds of utility. There was, they were not just to make the buildings beautiful, they actually had really strong utility and, and were put to, to good use. Oftentimes the doors were recessed and um, sometimes that's a single door, um, but oftentimes it's a pair of doors. And the bevel or the angle that the recessed in, in this middle bay, is fairly common. Sometimes they're off-centered slightly. Sometimes if you have a whole string of these or a much wider building, you'll have a series of recessed openings that go into multiple different shops. Um, but the recessed portion develops a real strong shadow within that bay, and it also protects people that are coming in and out from the elements. So all of this um, group of, 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 of terms are important to remember when you're putting together an application, especially, so people know you're talking the language. If you would say to them, well, my intent is to, to um, maybe repair the, uh, the window sills um, you know, in the front of this building, in the front facade, in the middle bay or something, then they would really say, that person <laughs> knows what they're talking about. In Bangor, this was a, an example I did of a large building in the area in downtown Bangor 
on the corner of Hammond and Columbia Streets in Bangor near the courthouse is this lovely Columbia building. This building has been very much modified. The lower floor, this entire storefront was taken away. So we wanted to show the commission in Bangor what did the building look like before it was changed out. And this is what it looked like. Today, it's a rather horrible, modern, just flush white panels were put across the whole base of this building. And it really looks quite awful. But what the architect, who was Wilfred Manser, in, in 1892 intended was for these doors, these arched entryways, to really become evident and, and obvious because of his use of arches. He was really known as an architect who loved to use the, the arch. So he uses this arch liberally across this building, even up into the cornice. All of this cornice is detailed in brick. And the building was really devalued, I think, Ellen, you would agree, by the change that occurred here in this lower storefront. And, and it has it all... It's nicely, it's my cat. I guess that's <laughs> awful. It, it used to be quite special. And again, the pilasters that we talked about that separate these big display windows, all of these were display windows that are on the entire base of it. So it felt very light. The glass made it feel like it was supporting a great, massive, heavy building. And so there was a bit of mystery and wonder about it. You know, how can this glass support this great massive building? So maybe someday, somewhere down the line, somebody will find the time and money to restore that. I hope that would be wonderful. But again, they're the same exact elements we've been talking about in your town. This again being a very strong element. If you look at that and squint your eyes, maybe the most important element in this whole architecture is that sign band that occurs right there because it distinguishes differences between the base of the building and the top. <clears throat> these, I'm going to have to read these to you, so please bear with me for a minute. But guidelines, these are put out by the National Park Service, and these are really, really good things to go by. And basically, they're telling you to become familiar with the style of your building as much as you can, and the role of the storefront in the overall design. Don't early up a front. I think we've all seen examples of this. Um, and we're not going to point fingers. Avoid stock lumberyard, colonial detailing such as coach lanterns, mansard overhangs, wood shades, non-operable shutters, and small panel windows, except where they existed historically. So what they're saying here is basically do your research, find out what you can from historic photos about the building, and try to be honest to what was there, uh, and not fake some earlier period. Preserve the storefront's character even though there is a new use on the interior. That's perfectly permissible and happens all the time. If less exposed window area is desirable, consider the use of interior blinds and insulating curtains rather than altering the existing historic fabric. What they're saying there is it's oftentimes you'll see wonderful big glass panels reduced down to plywood panels with a window stuck in the middle. So be careful. They're saying if there's ways that you can do that and still preserve that glass by using insulating curtains and blinds. Think about that. Um, avoid using materials that were unavailable when the storefront was constructed. And that takes a certain amount of thought. Um, if you know your period when the building was done uh, and what would have been available, it might help you to understand if the pieces are missing what, what it might have originally uh, been. It says this includes um, vinyl and aluminum siding, anodized aluminum, mirror or tinted glass, because sometimes mirror glass can be rather um, difficult anyway, unless it's a modern building, um, and artificial storm and brick, etc. And finally, choose paint colors based on the building's historical appearance. Um, in general, do not coat surfaces that have never been painted, and that's a really important thing to understand, um, especially brick. Sometimes brick can be painted uh, properly. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes it's not. Um, brick is actually designed to breathe to some degree, so sometimes what happens if you put a coating on the outside, it can trap moisture inside that uh, assembly and eventually blow the outside um, fired layer of the brick off. And if you lose that and you're into the soft core, of it, and we've all seen that happen, where sides of buildings are actually falling apart because they were painted, Oftentimes, that will expose the very soft inner core of the brick. And that, when you get to that point, you've got some problems. So I don't think anybody's going to tell you what are the proper colors to use. But in history, there were different colors were used in history. If you do a little bit of research, you can find the colors are not really as limiting as we might think today, that you have to use beige tones. 
They were actually, um, oftentimes, wood things in other parts of the building were painted out, depending on the style of the building. It might have actually been painted out to look very monolithic. Like the Rusikov building in town now has a bay that's painted out to match the brick. That might have been originally what the color was. Who knows? But if you find some earlier photos of that building and it looks like it was a lot lighter, you might guess that it would be done in some earth tone colors. But it was not unusual for them to match the color of the, the materials on the outside. I'm not going to read all of these because my eyes can't see them, first of all. But I do have that information to hand out to you all tonight. And this is really most important. If you're preserving buildings, these are the standards that the Secretary of the Interior recommends that everybody use for rehabilitation. And rehabilitation basically means if you're doing it, you're, you're reusing a building for uh, whatever use, you're not necessarily preserving the building. That's a different level of protection. Rehabilitation basically means that you could be adding a new use inside a building. And you've agreed that, that, uh, that they've, they've agreed that these 10 standards, and this is six of them here that are listed here, um, basically uh, combined with all, all of the standards will get you to a point where you can um, communicate that your building is or is not going to be able to meet these standards. If you can meet those, any of the buildings that are in the National Register Historic District or are eligible, or those that are outside of the downtown district, and are like the Bloomfield Academy and the, and the um, I believe the courthouse and other buildings in town that are on the National Register, if you use these standards, you can go after funding that will permit you to, to rehabilitate your buildings. If you're not going to follow these standards, you're, you're going to probably run into difficulties with the state of historic preservation. Yeah, that, that's the, the key thing. When, we, when you submit your building to the Maine Historic Preservation Commission for approval, these are the standards by which they judge whether or not what you're doing is appropriate. That's the same standard. It's not a mystery how they decide whether you meet or you know the criteria. That's that's it right there. So you read that if you say, okay, what I'm doing is within that, you have a good chance that they're just gonna approve it and no problem. If you're not meeting that and it's a it's a historic building or in the historic district, there's a good chance you won't get approved. It is. And right. that's that's why. It's you know, it's a national standard. It's not something they made up. It's not something we made up. It's, you know, it's what applies to a building that's either a National Register building or part of a National Register district. And I will say these, these standards have been pretty much in place. They've been slightly modified since 1966 when the National Preservation Act was, in, was enacted. So they've, they've had a lot of history uh, in, in themselves. Um, so we'll give you a copy of those. And this is a great resource. Um, as I pointed out to the preservation brief earlier on just historic storefronts, preserving historic storefronts, these are, this is a list of 47 briefs that are available to all of you. Uh, at any time, you need to go to the National Park Service website. You can download any one of these wonderful briefs. They're technical briefs. They're usually about four or five or six pages long. They help you on anything from how to remove graffiti from your building to how to preserve wood windows, copper, uh, flashings, everything you can imagine, awnings, how to consider accessibility, handicapped access to historic buildings. They are very, very valuable materials. So I just point those out for you to access. So I wanted to mention um, the main uniform building code um, in, in the state within the last five years, um, the state has adopted and is in place the main uniform building code. That's a, a building and energy code. It basically is composed of all of these parts, and I apologize, you can't read that one, I can show you. There's actually four codes and two standards. This one on the bottom, and you can't read it very well, is the main radon, uh, model radon standards. Um, ASHRAE are also standards, um, but these others are international code um, uh, um, codes uh, and the one that really applies for existing buildings is this one, the International Existing Building Code, the IEBC. Um, that is a special code that was developed just to recognize the importance um, of uh, preserving uh, historic buildings, not just historic buildings, but existing buildings, and recognizing 
that uh, many of the existing buildings in the United States require some level of, um, of protection and code compliance to make them safe. And I apologize, it's a bit hard to read, but there's actually a section in there in that 2009 IEBC for historic buildings. And it basically gives relief for historic buildings for complying with most of the provisions of the code. If, in the uh, judgment of the building official, it does not constitute a distinct life safety hazard or threat. Okay? That's a pretty big thing. So what it means is when you have a code officer and you're having communications with the code office, um, you need to be able to say, uh, by looking at that code, the IEPC, here's what is going to apply to my project or renovations or, re or uh, work, and uh, can you please uh, understand that this building is historic, or if it isn't, you know, what it is that you need to apply from that existing building code. But new buildings have their own code, that's the IBC, that's the commercial code, but the IEBC, now the state has an IEBC code, it was really put in place for the preservation of historic and existing buildings. What it basically is, is for example, if you have two stairs in your building and you want to eliminate one, you're not going to be able to do that. But if you only have one stair in your building and the current building codes would require you to have two, you may not have to have two if you meet the provisions of the fire code. The fire code will sometimes um, take precedence over these, but typically this allows you to keep the building you have the way you have it for the most part. Anything that's not what's considered a life safety issue, in other words, something that really uh, jeopardizes the safety of the people in the in the building, you're, it, it's been there for 100 years. Now why would you have to make it meet the current codes? And the truth of the matter is that many buildings, many buildings of this era, of the 1880s to like 1920s, actually meet most of the requirements of the code, but lots of things are hard to prove. It's hard to prove some of the, of the fire resistance um, qualifications. I mean, you know you've got three wides of brick, right? It's not going to burn very easily. But nonetheless, it's hard to prove that it has a fire rating of an hour or two hours or three hours. But they accept the fact that it's going to meet it. So um, many of the things that normally um, you would have to do for a new building, you don't have to do because it, it, you're given, a, you're given a, the benefit of the doubt, which I think, you know, given the building's been there for over 100 years. It's probably a yeah. right, well, wonderful thing to do. I'm looking out the door right now, and I can see there's, there's transom glass above those doors out there. That's a good example. Transom lights and glass like that is recognized as a special element in these older historic buildings that is worth preserving. Monumental stairs. There used to be a time when they were saying, I'm sorry, those stairs don't need compliance. You're going to have to create a new one. Now they actually do recognize monumental stairs and the need not to change those as being important to preserve these historic buildings. So there's a lot more to work with, and that's the code that we want to refer to. And so any building that's existing right now falls under that code, not under the new code. Right. This is a great publication, and I'd also direct you again to the National Park Service website. You can download this. It's one of the most interesting reads. It's fairly substantial. It's called Illustrated Guidelines on Sustainability for rehabilitating historic buildings. And that's a green roof. I don't know if it's put on a historic building or not, but it is definitely a, a living roof. Um, it has great information in there about things like if you wanted to do solar heating panels or if you wanted to do awnings, uh, if you wanted to do um, a green roof, if you wanted to do a whole host of things, what you need to consider that's special about its impact on historic building or, or, or buildings that are older. Sustainability is a very, very big thing and a very positive um, energy in the United States right now. Sustainability, we like to say that the greenest building is the one that's already built. And there's a lot of truth in that. Because, as you can see here, 43% of our U.S. carbon emissions come from the construction and operation of buildings. And the carbon that is released constructing just a 50,000 square foot building, equivalent to driving a car 2.8 million miles. And that's a long way. When we use the term embodied energy, we're talking about the investment that you've got in an existing building. So all of these bricks, everything that's worth preserving in a building like this means that you don't have to go out and cut new trees. You don't have to go and create new brick or excavate stone now. All of that embodied energy that is in that building already has, has 
a lot of value. So sustainability, again, the greenest building is the one that exists. You've got a great sustainable core here in, in the community. Um, just briefly, we all know historic downtowns and neighborhoods are walkable. It's a great way to reduce the sprawl if you can get people living. What we're seeing in Bangor now is a lot of young people are moving into the downtown core. And the lights are going on in the upstairs, so there's very little vacant space left. I think the more and more that, that happens, the better, the better chances are that you have for a vibrant um, and, and, and an active downtown. And this is a true fact. Pre-1920s buildings are more energy efficient than most buildings that were constructed from 1920 to 2000. That's pretty powerful stuff. Even though they say your buildings are not terribly well insulated, well, guess what? Those walls are 16 inches thick, solid brick. And they're holding, they're holding a lot in. There's a great publication also you can download for Maine Preservation. That's actually called Guidelines for Improving Energy Efficiency in Historic Buildings. That was put together by a group of people, a fairly large group that worked on just looking at main buildings, the needs for main buildings. So this is a great publication, and I'm not going to get on to all of these items, but there are some really, really important things to consider about how to stop moisture and keep moisture from getting inside places where it shouldn't be. So I'm just going to give a little lecture, a mini lecture on my most upsetting thing. Um, Efficiency Maine, which is an organization that gives people, uh, that benefits people that do things that are energy efficient in both commercial and residential buildings, has programs where people come and give you advice on making your home or your building more energy efficient. And one of the things that, that lots of times they do is tell you to insulate your basement. If you have an older uh, building that has a stone or a masonry basement, the worst thing you can do is put insulation on the inside of that basement against the, the foundation wall. And the, 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 those, uh, the information that was given out was based on buildings, the majority of buildings in the country are built uh, since the 1950s. The residential stock, most of it is from the 1950s. Those usually had concrete basements. There's an, there's nothing wrong with putting insulation against concrete. It won't do any harm. But if you put insulation against a masonry foundation, be it stone or brick, what happens is moisture gets trapped because there's moisture in the, in the ground. There's also moisture generated inside the building. But in this case, it's in the, in, the, in the ground. And it migrates into the wall, and then it sits there. And it destroys the mortar that holds the stones together or holds the brick together. And in fact, it'll destroy the bricks. And so for years, um, nobody was, was saying anything about it. You know, they have these national standards for making your house or your building more energy efficient, and people were insulating. So if you have insulation in your basement, or go home and tear it out, um, it's just really bad. Now, you can do it by leaving a, an airspace between the, the, the wall and, and, venting, and that. venting that space. Um, and that will provide you with insulation, but the way most of it's done is, is really bad. So that's one of the reasons why, um, why Maine Preservation came out with these, um, these guidelines, is because they, the, there was just too much misinformation in terms of the benefits of, of, uh, of insulation. I mean, it's great. Your building's now warmer, except over time it's falling apart, and you don't know about it because it's hidden behind insulation. So that's the kind of things we, we really have like strong feelings about and work hard to try and get the information out there so you don't do anything that jeopardizes the longevity of, of valuable assets that you have. Recognizing that it's hard to get to the outside of the walls in the downtown, especially in buildings that are all collected together. But these, all of these issues are really very fully described in this guidelines book, which is, a, I think, a great resource. Now, resources for rehabilitation, some of these you may be familiar with, certainly the CDBG facade program, Jeff, that's what you're using right now, right? Mm -hmm. But there's many others, the Main Street programs, Cohegan Main Street, you have a, a Main Street program here in, in Cohegan, I guess it's celebrating like 10 years. Um, these other ones you may not be as familiar with, but there are historic preservation and rehabilitation tax credits, um, that's for commercial operations, that's big. That's 20% tax credit from the feds. That's 20% in addition, 20% from the state. 
So you could get 40% of your certified rehabilitation in forms of tax credits if you do the right thing. Again, those standards that we share with you are part of doing the right thing. So if you're serious or you've got significant rehabilitation costs that, you've got, that are going to occur, you might very well look into this idea. Another one is historic, the state has historic preservation develop, development funds. You can apply every year for a portion. Those things are usually in the $10,000 range, but I wouldn't hesitate if you've got needs and you've got a historic building and it's, it's, or it's eligible, you can apply through the state of Maine every year for historic preservation development uh, grants and funding. The Main Street program, um, again, you have it here. They are a great resource to building and promoting your downtown. This design workshop that we're doing right now is actually important, I think, for, for your Main Street folks as well. Um, one that you may not have heard of, Grants to Green, that really applies. That's a fairly new program that encourages energy uh, evaluations um, and uh, improvements to be made to nonprofits. That really applies only to nonprofits in the downtowns. So that's what they're focused on. Again, if you're a National Register building, that's a bonus, um, but it doesn't have to be a National Register building. So Grants to Green, you might investigate if you've got someone downtown who's a nonprofit. And Belvedere Fund, that's, district, that's um, um, authorized through the Maine um, Community Foundation, actually, the MCF. And they actually will um, make money available to targeted to downtown buildings, preservation of historic buildings in the downtown. The Grand Theater in Ellsworth used Belvedere funds and got about 45,000 of their 90,000 dollars hit, so 50-50 match. So there's all sorts of resources out there, and this is just a few of them if you're looking for money. The Main Street program you're familiar with, there's now the state looks like it's got measles. This is really catching on. Main Street is a very good program uh, done through the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I think it's interesting to know, this is actually, this slide's a little bit old, but in, through the rehabilitation tax credits have encouraged since 2008, probably significantly much more than this, but in, up until a couple years ago, about $250 million worth of construction in our state. A lot of work is going on, and that was especially in a time when construction for new work was way down, and this work was carrying a lot of contractors. Uh, rehabilitation of historic buildings is, is very popular and is doing very well. A couple years ago, I was involved in a program through the Maine Downtown Center called Green Downtowns Initiative. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but it's, it's a, a larger global look at your downtown for things not just about buildings. It's about the spaces that are in between, about developing green canopies, about transit, about trying to encourage living in a downtown, what you need to do with standards to do that. But it's really focused on developing an attitude of a green downtown. So we went through and looked at six different communities. This information is available, again, through the main um, downtown center. Um, this one happens to be downtown Dover Foxcroft, where things like uh, intersection improvements were considered, signage improvements, stormwater park where water's collected, and using bioretention in a better way to get rid of stormwater, uh, setting up farmer's markets and identifying places for that. You all may have done a lot of these things already. Um, regional bus stops and identifying where that is. We, we showed them where increased plantings could actually help to reduce their cooling loads. Um, plazas and pocket parks in spaces where they could be especially connecting uh, between nodes. So this was kind of a linkage. Um, green roofs. Every community had something different. So you might actually pull back and look at your whole greater downtown area and figure out how to make these linkages and how do we have buses stopping where we want and we have farmers markets and encourage people to come into the downtown. Um, we also looked at the architecture and the preservation of some buildings. This is a rather sad, important building in the center of Dover Foxcroft. Um, it's the old Masonic uh, block. Uh, it looked like this originally. So we did um, a series of renderings in all these communities to help them to see what the building would look like restored. And the amazing thing about this was, talk about green. These people were thinking about green way before it became a popular term today. Here's a storefront that was facing south. So they put a really a powerful deep hood above that. So their horizontal band here is actually developed into a roof that shades a lot of the glass that's in the front and still bounces light off the underside of that soffit into the shops inside. The Masonic Lodge was upstairs. 
and we really would love to see this building restored. This is a key part of downtown Dover Foxtrot. We talked about things like um, lighting, changing over to LED lighting, um, about the building fabric, and how important it is to retain and respect that and preserve those materials. Because those windows, when they wrap it in vinyl, there's a chance that they'll trap moisture inside. This is just kind of closing. I wanted to share with you an example of a building in Bangor that was in really, really tough shape. This was the old Penobscot Theater. If you ever went to the theater in Bangor years ago, um, this bank, which was Merrill Bank at the time, I had worked with them, and they were sitting there watching this, the collapse of this beautiful building next door. Pieces were falling off the building. It was in very, very tough shape. Um, it was uh, not being kept up. Not because the theater didn't make enough money, they just didn't have the wherewithal to kind of get out from underneath it. So the bank acquired this beautiful um, 1888 uh, Best Street building. And the only way they could make it work, and this is, I think, in Skowhegan, I see you've done some of these things already. You've been putting some new infill buildings um, that help to connect uh, multiple buildings. That's happening more and more, and there was new legislation in Maine just passed this last year that will enable and encourage developments in the upper floors of downtowns. And basically what they did, this was the original bank, this was the building next door. Uh, we designed it so that this elevator could serve both buildings. Um, there was a link that needed to be made. The floors were different, the finished floors were different elevations. That's not uncommon between buildings. Um, and the only way that they could make it work economically inside the old theater was to actually to develop another floor. So a whole other floor was added in that intermediate layer. And we pulled, to keep the light coming inside, we pulled the walls back off, as you can see here, kept the large windows on the outside, and pulled those walls way back in so that light gets nice and deep and shared inside the building. The building is a real gateway improvement into downtown Bangor. It's one of the most significant um, improvements done in the city recently. Um, there's the linkage, the ramps that occur between the two buildings. And it's a building that's going to survive for many, many more years. They actually put a new slate roof on it. The slate that they put on was, was from Vermont. And um, I think they did a really spectacular job with this, uh, this building. It just evidence of how buildings can be terribly in rough shape and way beyond where you think they can ever be returned. And there's an example of one that, that, that was returned from the can. Um, so here's some resources uh, that's a bit hard to read, um, but Maine Town, Town Center, Maine Historic Preservation Commission, uh, Grow Start Maine has an awful lot of materials that you can share. Maine Preservation is a, um, a private group that promotes preservation all over the state of Maine, and they're very helpful. They will actually send field reps in for free if you need them. They will come to your community or come to your business and help you to see what's important about your buildings and your downtown. Uh, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, there's their connection, and the Maine Bureau of Codes and Standards uh, for the folks that do basically the, um, the, the, the codes and standards that we were talking about earlier. So, thank you. That's, that's about it. And if we could bring the lights up, I'll, um, I'll share some more materials around. <laughs> and I would say that um, we understand, as I look across the district, that we've got at least four facades that we're going to be talking with those, Jeff, mm -hmm. those owners about. If anyone is here today representing any one of those four, would like to stick around afterwards, Ellen and I have got uh, we can begin that conversation and set up a meeting next time. But I'm going to share with you right now, this is the standards that we talked about, the Secretary of the Interior standards. So let me get a couple of those going around. Again, this, this is not complex stuff, but it is the stuff that if you're going to seek monies and grants, this is probably important for you to be able to understand what they're going to be expecting. Or what. And those standards are actually fairly general, and they're the sort of thing that, um, that you can have a dialogue with the state office about. Um, if it's a national register building that you're dealing with, you'll be talking to Christy Mitchell, down at the state office, and Christy is a very, help, very helpful, would you say, Ellen? Yes. She's the sort of person who would be right here, you know, the next day to talk with you and take you through it and help you to see what's important about your building. So, um, we've talked about an awful lot. So, why don't you put the slide up that has the um, the storefront on it with all the parts labeled, the little simple ones? Oh yeah. Back to that. I think that's 
like the key one. I think that the biggest thing that we see when we look at um, the downtowns is we see that people in, in the interest of maybe security, maybe in the interest of uh, saving money on energy or whatever, take that lower storefront and cover it with another material and block out all the signs of what the building was. And I think one of the biggest things that these grants, one of the biggest focus of these grants is what can we do to get it to look more like that and less like a piece of plywood with a little hole cut in it. Um, so, um, you know, that's, I think that's the biggest, you know, that's the biggest piece of the puzzle. Because when it starts to look like, all your buildings start to look like that, then the downtown starts to have this whole other feel. As I like to say, everybody would like their, their, their downtown to look sort of like downtown, um, you know, Main Street in Disneyland. You know, that's <laughs> what we, we kind of want, that number of people, that number of activity, and that, you know, that, that uh, line. And that flavor of ice cream. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, not, it's not impossible. I mean, but one of the things is that the, that the storefronts have to look open and inviting. And even if they don't have uh, a commercial, you know, if you're not selling books or shoes or, or ice cream inside, it's still just that feeling that, you know, you walk by, you want to walk by it and look and see what's inside and you know, see what's going on. I think we've all seen good examples of, of commercial buildings, like you're saying, and, and they do get your attention, at least get my attention. When I see it done properly, I look when it's uh, in color, it doesn't mean much to me at all, but, but when those things are covered up, like oh, they put on some kind of a false mansard, which was a very popular thing in the 70s, and you see that a lot, you may lose some of these, uh, the evidence of what this building is about. And you can almost see pieces of it. If you look real closely at some of your buildings that they've been changed up, you can actually see behind what the improved pieces were that there was something else there. And that's intriguing. And you might ask yourself, well, why, why did it have to be done? Well, sometimes there might not have been a good reason why it was done. And, and it can be undone just as easily. As you can see in a lot of successful rehab buildings. Um, and that's where you can seek grant money to do that. That's one of the best uses. One of the most powerful grants you can put together is to restore a building back to what its original components were or at least expose them again. And so a lot of it starts with research, and a lot of it starts with knowing what you're looking at, and hopefully with giving you at least a little bit of a toolbox, you know what I mean, to kind of take forward. So how many are from Skowhegan and Main Street? Do you have, you are? Yes. Hi. Okay. You, were you guys looking for a new director? Is that your story? She is a new director. <laughs> oh, well, congratulations. Okay. Yes. Welcome. Um, yes, yeah, so um, you guys, it's like a four point sort of thing, right? You're promoting and organizing and getting all that together. Well, as Ellen says, the consistency, the look of consistency is really a key thing. Not that everybody has to use the same kind of advertising or colored signs or this or that, but, but you, can, um, you can really tell a lot about activities and what the kind of buildings that you want to go into when you see that place and you have them. I think one of the things that has at least been asked to me uh, a couple times is how hot is it to incorporate solar in some of these buildings and stuff and still maintain the historical aspects of the building yeah. but use your roof for other things. Really and stuff. good question. Really good question. And that publication that I referred to on guidelines to sustainability has a whole series of, of uh, do's and do nots about solar panels. Um, I think what they're saying essentially, Jeff, is if you can do it in such a way that it doesn't impact the fabric of the building, say, like you're not hanging it off the side or something, and you can do it on your roof where it might be less visible, and there's, you know, because you think about the public view, you think about what people see when they look at the building, you may have a flat roof like this, and you can tuck those all above on the roof. That, I think that's essentially what they're going to be saying. If you wanted to incorporate it, you know, and it had a heavy-handed effect on the fabric, or what, they, they use a term that's called um, char uh, character-defining elements. And when we look at a building like this, as I pointed out, a lot of these things are called character-defining elements. What that term means is that if you've got a really strong cornice line up there, and you want to, I don't know, 
we wanted to hang some panels off from that somehow. They might say, gee, that's really a character defining element. It's important to the architecture and the understanding of the building. Please consider putting it back or setting it over here. So yeah, it's done all the time. It's not discouraged. And awnings are actually a very, very big part of the preservation um, now in terms of sustainability. And the deep windows that you see there, oftentimes uh, awnings were designed so that they could roll in or roll out of those. You might look at some of the old, I think we saw some actually uh, in, this, in this slideshow. If you look at some of the early photos on Main Street right here, you'll see a liberal use of awnings. Now, in some cases, they look like they were so low, you could barely get underneath them. But awnings do have an appropriate place you know, for shading, especially for those that appears that this might be at the south side over here, because everybody appears to have awnings on that side more so than the other. So um, I don't know if that's the case or not. But, but certainly, if you, if you, awnings are actually an important part that you consider. Again, that's in that sustainability guidelines. Are these guidelines. roofs that they're concerned about as opposed to flat roofs? Or, or I think it was a mixture of different uh, roof so structures and stuff that they're looking at. I think on the slope roofs, you have to really look how, at how they're installed. I mean, it gets, sometimes it's very subtle. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson has skylights on Monticello. So it's not like, you know, these things aren't historic. They probably weren't on, the, there probably were the, um, skylights on some of your buildings and others not. Lots of times they had uh, light walls in the center of the building to bring light now. But um, on a slope roof, it really, again, it would be the subtleties of how visible is that roof from the street. Does it affect the main characteristics of the building? Um, so it kind of has to be looked at one by one. But there's nothing that precludes it, per se, no. from being on the building. So. Yeah. Any questions at all? If not, um, all of the stuff that was passed out tonight and any other stuff we can get our hands on will be posted on the website in the facade section. You're more than welcome to go into that at any time. Give us a couple days to get everything processed and up, but it will be up there hopefully by next week. Um, and Mike and everybody will be here for... Uh, if you have some direct questions on your projects, if you're one of the last couple on doing your projects and stuff, uh, Mike's going to be working with you on yours, trying to make sure everything gets through historical the way you guys want. So this is the time to kind of talk to them, and you can set up times where they'll come up and actually sit down one-on-one -on -one with you beyond this and stuff. So yeah, that's thank what you. Like to do is Maybe if, if, if those four um, facade applicants, Jeff, could, if they're here, could stick around. We have three that, of them here, that's okay. all. Could stick around, we can at least um, look, make sure we understand what it is you want to do. We have some of your basic information already yeah. kind of with us, so. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Good stuff.